Hi, I'm Lenny Frateri, professor at Waynesburg University, and you're watching Dingo Talk. You want to know by now. You want to know by now. You want to know by now. You want to know. You want to know. You want to know. What's going on, Chuckleheads? I am Carlo Guadagnino. This is Dingo Talk. My guest, legendary Pirates announcer and now assistant professor at Waynesburg, Lanny Frateri. Lanny, thank you for taking the time to join us. Carlo, thanks for the invite. Uh, be careful throwing that word legendary around too easily, all right? Um, uh, I don't, I'm not, uh, I'm just a regular guy that uh, had, a, had a desire at age 12 to be a baseball announcer. And um, I am very blessed to have uh, realized my dream, became a Pirates broadcaster and, and lived that dream for 33 years, the most uh, most fortunate for me, and I had I had a, tr a tremendous number of people that that helped me along the way. My mom and dad knew of my love for broadcasting and did everything in their power to help me. Uh, and then in high school, my teachers, uh, my football coach, my basketball coach, uh, my homeroom teacher, they all knew that that broadcasting was my dream, and and they were wonderful. They did uh, did so much to encourage me um, to to go after it. Now, so let's take you back to 1966. Why Ithaca? Because that's where you end up graduating from. What drew you to Ithaca and what was what was life like in Ithaca for your time there? Well, I came down to um, I came down to two uh, options, uh, one being Ithaca College and the other one being Syracuse. Um, I, I, I'm sure you know, Carlo, that uh, Syracuse is considered by many people to be the greatest uh, broadcast school in America. We've had so many great broadcasters that have come out of Syracuse. But I, when I attended, uh, when I when I went on my visits, I was concerned that Syracuse was going to be too big for me. Mm -hmm. I, I I was uh, scared to death of the fraternity process. I wanted no part of that. Uh, and when I went to Ithaca, I had a sense that the the community was more around the student union, and so. You know, maybe I was a coward in that regard, but uh, uh, there's no question at no at no point in my life that I questioned that Ithaca was the right choice and the right place for me to be. Now, what was the communications department like at Ithaca? Well, uh, I thought it was great. Um, um, admittedly, there was not the the specific um, focus on sports broadcasting. But I, I did know that what I needed to, as a young broadcaster, when I moved into Ithaca, I needed to, to get on the air. I needed to continue to develop myself as a broadcaster and, and learn the principles of broadcasting. Now, I was fortunate because we did have some opportunities while I was at Ithaca. Uh, I did some television basketball of Ithaca games, and I did, I did a couple hockey games while I was at Ithaca. But there really wasn't a lot of opportunities to do play by play, mm -hmm. but you know, it really wasn't all that big a deal for me because uh, when I was talking before about, about wanting to be a broadcaster when I was 13 years old, um, I, I uh, practiced my, I honed my skills uh, during my, my formative years. Uh, my, I have an older brother. Mm -hmm. So when I was 13, he was 17 and, and when my brother would play baseball, my dad would park the car so that I could sit in the front seat of the car and announce the games. Um, and I grew up in Rochester, New York, and I was a big Yankees fan. And interestingly enough, my brother's team had pinstripes. And I never worried about my brother's uh, 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 teammates' names. Mm -hmm. I, just, I just made all my brother's players Yankees. So the guy catching was Yogi Berra and Bobby Richardson at second base and Moose Gowan at first and Mantle in center and Maris in right and Kubek at short, et cetera. So um, as I say, I, I mean, I, I spent hours upon hours of practicing to be a baseball announcer and, um, um, and, and of course trying to uh, ascertain from listening to Mel Allen, the voice of the Yankees, and listening from a guy named a guy named Tom Decker, who was the voice of the Rochester Red Wings, my hometown team, I uh, was trying to uh, infuse into my being uh, the concept of what a baseball announcer was supposed to sound like, and mm -hmm. and so um, that served me particularly well when I got to that point where I was now a play-by-play -play announcer. 
so as you're, you know, so you, you've said it a couple of times where from 12 years old on, you knew what you wanted to do and you worked towards that. As a professor, is that one of the things that you're, that you're now teaching other people is that even if you can't get to cover the football game or the baseball game or whatever, you can still go and sit and watch the game and hone those skills yourself, right? Well, that, that's a great point. And what I have told my students that have come to Waynesburg is that uh, uh, they have to, as quickly as possible, start working on their skills. I mean, consider the fact that if you if you talk to a college baseball player, a college basketball player, player, or college football player, those individuals have all been playing the sport since they were eight or nine years old. Mm -hmm. And so their talents have been developed over a decade and a half. And so the same thing, and I'm telling my students, if you've not done any broadcasting, you need to find ways to do that. Now, at Waynesburg, that's one of the things that we are very religious about, is we are very adamant about telling the students and affording the students opportunities to practice their play-by-play -play for football, basketball, and baseball. And then we also encourage them to do other sports, because who knows what talents you may need to have and the versatility will serve you well. Can you do volleyball? Can you do soccer? You know, can, can you even announce a wrestling match? Yeah. Uh, and, 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 but the great thing is, is that the, the, the key points about what it takes to get ready to do a sporting event are significant, whether you're doing a major sport or something that would be considered quote unquote, a, a secondary sport. So, when you graduate from Ithaca in, in, in 1970, you go, you end up back in Rochester with your hometown radio station as a disc jockey. And that's where you really start to build up the the play-by-play -play career as well, correct? Well, to a certain extent I did. I, 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 um, I, when I, when I was in high school and even in college, I worked with the Empire Sports Network, uh, which was a local TV operation uh, that did, for example, the, the horse racing from Bedavia Downs, and I even did some, some college football. Um, uh, I remember we went to Colgate to do a football game. Uh, we did a Syracuse Pitt game at, at Pitt Stadium, and I was there uh, as the assistant to the play-by-play -play announcer, so I was looking for every opportunity I could mm -hmm. to, to be a part of broadcasting and start learning, and, and was fortunate that that uh, Bill Schwang and, and uh, Pete Brown um, let me be a part of it. And it was not, you know, there was no money involved and I wasn't looking for money. I was looking for the opportunity to, uh, to, to be a part of it. And so, uh, and then I did do some, uh, uh, I, I remember doing a couple of uh, Pop Warner football games on television. Uh, and then I, while I was a disc jockey at WBBF in Rochester, I became the public address announcer for the Rochester Red Wings baseball team. But my, you know, my dream was always to be a major league announcer. And, and one of the advantages, by the way, of, of uh, being a terrible disc jockey, and I was off, <laughs> I was just a downright awful disc jockey. But, and one of the advantages of, of that was that um, it, I, I didn't get, I didn't get sequestered into that disc jockey job I got to a point where I said, I've, I've got to go and do what I want to do. And that is baseball. And, mm -hmm. and of course, Charleston, West Virginia was the big break for me there. Well, so how do you make your way from, from upstate New York, right? Rochester would be considered upstate New York down to Charleston, West Virginia. Well, um, when I was working for the Red Wings, the general manager um, was Carl Steinfeld. And Carl decided to become general manager of the Charleston Baseball Club. And when he was selected to take that job, he asked me if I would consider going to Charleston with him um, as the voice of the Charleston Charlies. And I said, of course I will. Um, and not for a lot of money. Um, that seems to be a common theme when it relates to, as it relates to young people getting involved in broadcasting. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was not obsessed with having to live in Rochester and work only in Rochester. Uh, so the fact that I went to Charleston and, and had a chance to do over 100 baseball games in the summer of 1974. Now, admittedly, one of the concerns I had, because I was married at the time and my wife was teaching, she uh, was a speech therapist at a local school district, was that um, um, I didn't know, okay, so I've done baseball for six months 
but I'm not making a lot of money. What are we going to do for the winter? And I was fortunate that a job with the Rochester Americans hockey team opened up and I was selected to do that job. And so I had six months of baseball, six months of hockey, and both general managers agreed to get together and, and work it out so that when there was overlap, um, that they, they would help me work that out. Well, and it seems to be a running theme in the industry as well. Uh, the, the, you don't, don't walk away from an open door. It's like you said, it's not going to be the right away. The money's not going to be there, but the experience that you're going to get and the people you're going to meet are what's going to build that, that resume. Yeah, that's, uh, that's so true. And, and it's a point that I keep driving home to my students is that you cannot be obsessed or you can't be concerned about how much money you're going to make. And the other thing is you can't be obsessed about, about uh, only working in your hometown. I, I've often told my students, if you want to work in your hometown, make it your last job. Don't make it your first job. If, if you grew up as a, as a fan of a Pittsburgh team, for example, you can't, you can't um, say, well, I'm only going to work for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Or I'm only going to work for the Pittsburgh Penguins or Pirates. Because as a matter of fact, an interesting story about that is that Jack Hillgrove's grandson, uh, Bill Hillgrove's grandson, Jack, graduated from Waynesburg in the, in the spring of uh, 2021. And he's now working at a TV station in Steubenville. Mm -hmm. And Jack is a very talented guy. And I've told him numerous times, Jack, there's a great chance you're going to be an NFL announcer, but it's probably not going to be the Steelers because when Jack, when, when your grandfather retires, you're not going to be ready yet. Yeah. And somebody else is going to step into that job. Tony Caridi from WVU or some local Pittsburgh TV guy or whatever, but somebody else is going to step in there. And so you, you cannot just focus on only wanting to be a Pittsburgh sportscaster, your big break a good chance is going to come somewhere else. Now, is that, have you, have you given that advice to other broadcasters that you've worked with as well? Is that they're, they definitely have the talent, but you're going to have to, it's going to have to go somewhere else. You're going to have to prepare a little yeah, bit. Um, my, my second year in Waynesburg, I was talking to a young man and I said to him, what do you want to do? And he said, I want to be the voice of the Penguins. And I said, no, no, you want to be the voice of any NHL team. Because no, no, I only want to be the voice of the Penguins. And I, and I said, wait a minute. I said, you know, I gave him an, uh, I, I said, hypothetical, okay? Uh, 10, 15 years from now, uh, the Philadelphia Flyers come to you and say they want to give you $350,000 to be the voice of the Flyers. And he said to me, I wouldn't take the job. And I said, well, you're an idiot then. You know, that, that's stupid. Yeah. And, um, um, and so there, there's no question in my mind that, that when it comes to, being a part of, of the broadcast fraternity, when you're looking to be moving forward in broadcasting, you have to be open-minded about what you'll take financially. Mm -hmm. And you've got to find a way, if, if you're not getting paid a lot of money, you've got to find a way to make it work for you financially. And the other thing is, is that you need to open up so that every market in the, in the country is a possible job opportunity for you. Well, so let's come back to you in, in Charleston. Uh, we'll wrap, we're going we're gonna to ask this last question before we, we take our first break, and then we'll come out with more of your, your Pirates history and, and later on. But so you have two years in Charleston, and then you make your way up to uh, work with Bob Prince, correct? What, what happened for me was is that in 1974, when I was in Charleston, the Pirates came down and played an exhibition game. And Bill Guilfoyle was the public relations director of the Pirates. And when we were talking and he, I told him I was from Rochester, he said, well, when you drive back from Charleston to Rochester, you're going to go through Pittsburgh. Why don't you stop and spend a couple of days with us in Pittsburgh? And what was very fortuitous for me was that 1974 was the year that Steve Blass came down to the minor leagues. And it just so happened that Steve and his wife, Karen, lived in the same apartment complex with Liz and me. Mm -hmm. And when I told Steve about the fact that I was going to come through Pittsburgh at the end of the year, he said, well, stay with us. And so I did. I spent two days in Pittsburgh and Steve orchestrated me getting to the ballpark, et cetera. And then uh, Bill Guilfoyle arranged for me to sit in the broadcast booth with Bob Prince. Now, here's what's quite remarkable about this, this uh, turn of events is that when I was in the broadcast booth, I got there, you know, four thirty, five o'clock in the afternoon. And 
and spend a little time on the field, thanks to Steve, and then, you know, sat in the broadcast booth. And, and, and I, of course, I never did a, I never went to a baseball game where I didn't keep score. Mm-hmm. Okay. I can't imagine anybody going to a baseball game and not keeping score. And so I was keeping score. Well, Bob Prince came up to me in the third inning of that game and said, uh, hey, uh, you, you want to do an inning of play by play? And, and I, you know, I thought he was kidding. I mean, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't know me from Adam. He just met me. And now all of a sudden he wants to put me on the air. Well, he did. And I did an inning of play by play. And both he and Nellie King were extremely complimentary to me. And I did it again the next night. And then I went back in 75 and did the same thing. And what's also rather um, uh, unique about the, the, the development of things is that in 75, when I came back, Bob and Nellie were talking to me about maybe being the third man in the broadcast booth with them, mm-hmm. that I'd be the guy to do the pregame interviews and I'd do a little play-by-play when we were on television, et cetera, et cetera, on radio. Well, when Bob Prince and Nellie King got fired in, in October of 1975, I thought my dream went down the drain with them. And so, um, you know, but, but, but quite, you know, fortunately, I had a good audition tape, a guy named George Klebe who was the engineer for Bob Prince and Nellie King. He re- George recorded my, in, my, my play-by-play. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure you can understand, as can your, your, your listeners and viewers, that, that if, if, you, if you listen to a major league play-by-play tape with the murmuring of a major league ballpark, as opposed to a minor league tape, where you can basically hear individual voices because there are a few people at the ballpark, Mm-hmm. The, the, the major league tape sounds so much more professional. And so having that tape, thanks to George, George Cleave was, was extremely beneficial so that when I did audition for the job and when I did need to send in a tape, I had something that was, was pretty good. Well, I think 1976 would be a good place to pick up when we come out of the break here. Uh, I have to send it to our sponsor, Chambers General Store here in the town of Bethany. Uh, if Chambers doesn't have it, you don't need it. It's a fact. It's on the back of their t-shirts now. They've got two of them. You can get it in red. You can get it in Waynesburg orange now. Uh, there's also uh, soup sa- soups, breakfast sandwiches, biscuits and gravy, lunch specials, dollar sandwiches if you want. And, any, and, and the, the facts really are the truth. If you've been to Bethany and you walked into Chambers, you know it. You can get your breakfast sandwich and then you can get a saw or the screw that you need or a hammer or whatever all at the same side. But I am Carlo Guadagnino. This is Lanny Terry, professor at Waynesburg University and the former voice of the Pittsburgh Pirates. And we will be right back. While you're in Bethany, make sure you stop in the store for a daily lunch special, breakfast sandwiches all day, Try out the biscuits and gravy, guaranteed it'll fill you up. And also look for our new burnt orange chambers. If we don't have it, you don't need it t-shirts. And our psychedelic green third edition Bethany Mushroom Capital of the World t-shirts. Now back to you, Dingo. What's going on, Chuckleheads? I am Carlo Guadagnino. This is Dingo Talk. My guest, Lanny Terry, professor at Waynesburg University and former voice of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Uh, we left off talking about how the job is now Lanny's for the, the taking, I guess. 1976, great time to be in Pittsburgh, too, I'm guessing, right? Well, it was. It, um, and by the way, I want to thank you again, Carlo, for asking me to be a, be a part of your program. Thank you for doing that. Um, uh, 1976, you know, you've got a guy that landing for Terry that that uh, is quite confident that he can be a baseball announcer, but has a lot of questions. Um, Milo Hamilton was my partner. Um, I learned a lot from Milo, um, but I also had a chance to, to uh, talk to Bob Prince uh, extensively. Uh, it, it's somewhat, um, it, at times I find it hard to, to remember and believe that Bob Prince, even though I was one of the guys that took his job, that he wanted to help me. And he gave me tremendous, tremendous advice. You know, one of the things he told me was that, Lanny, you can't just be a voice on the air. You need to get out and meet Pittsburghers and, uh, and get them, let them know that you care about them as individuals. And I certainly did. But, I, but I've got to be honest with you. Uh, 1976, I signed on with the Pirates with a one-year contract. 
And um, I did not know until December 1st of 1976 whether I was coming back for a second year or not. And even, you know, my second year, one year contract, third year, one year contract, fourth year, one year contract. So there was a great deal of trepidation on my part, wondering, you know, am I going to, you know, the, and I'm sure you can appreciate this is that as challenging and as, as scary as it is to wonder if you'll ever get a break and get the job, mm-hmm. it's also scary to worry about, okay, I've got it. Will I lose it? And, um, and I had a lot of questions about, you know, who should I be as a broadcaster? I knew the nuts and bolts of baseball announcing. I knew that. Mm-hmm. I was confident about that. But I also had a lot of questions. And, and as a matter of fact, uh, <laughs> you know, one of the things that, that happened to Milo and me is that because Bob Prince was such a popular announcer, th- there was a lot of criticism of Milo and me. And, uh, and, and when I first worked in Pittsburgh, I would, you know, when I was driving home from the ballpark, I would be listening to the talk show and the people were calling in and telling and, and talking about how bad we were. And I got to a point where I couldn't listen anymore because mm-hmm. I, I just couldn't stay confident if I believed all the bad things that were being said about, about me. And, um, but, but I also was, I guess, smart enough to understand that, that there was an acceptance that had to be there. That it wasn't just because I was somebody anointed me as a pirate broadcaster that that meant that pirate fans had to, had to uh, um, accept me. And here's the other thing too, that, that, that I fortunately thought about when I started is that one of the scariest things about being a pirate broadcaster in 1976 for me was that I was quite certain that 99% of my audience knew more about the pirates than I did. I'd never been to Forbes field. Okay. I never saw Roberto Clemente play. I knew limited information about Honus Wagner and Pie Trainer, and and even to a certain extent, couldn't have told you an awful lot when I started about the '60 World Series or the '71 World Series. It was only over a period of time that I committed myself to learning about that that I finally did have the knowledge that I needed to be somewhat in, up to up to date and in step with, with my viewers. So, you know, one of the things I, I remember one day I was, uh, uh, we had Lee Mazzilli who was a pirate uh, uh, player. Mm-hmm. And I once referred to Lee Mazzilli as Maz. And I got tons of letters. You can't call him Maz. <laughs> Lee Mazzilli's not Maz, you know? And, and, and there was a whole, you know, series of those kinds of, of, of points that I, I hadn't thought about and, but, Pirates fans made me think about it in a hurry. And Pirates fans are something special because ups and downs with the Buccos aside, they there is a loyalty to the, that, the brand and the team that there's certain names, you know, you're never going to call somebody else Pops. You're never going to call somebody else Maz. And there's just certain names that you don't. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, I, that's a very interesting uh, first couple of years. I had a uh, follow-up question to your so the beginning with the one year contracts, was that a normal process for when you when you made it to the majors for other broadcasters? Was that a, or was that based on the organization organization to organization on whether they were going to offer long term deals or the one like year at a time? Well, the answer is, I don't know that, but that's not the point. The point to me, I'll, I'll tell you a story, too, is a guy named Bill Hartman. When I signed my first contract, Bill Hartman had me come to KDKA and he put the contract in front of me and he walked out of the room for him and he came back like three minutes later and he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm reading my contract. He goes, why? And I said, what do you mean? Why? He said, well, you're going to sign it no matter what it says. Right. And he's right. I mean, I, you know, they, they could have had in the contract that I had to give up my son, you know, that you have to give up your, your, your three-year-old or your, well, he was, he was one-year-old at the time. You, you know, but he's right. I mean, it didn't matter what the money was. It didn't, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not turning down a chance to be a pirate broadcaster because there's something in the contract that I don't like. And there were tons of things in the contract that I learned to hate, you know, including the fact that they didn't have to tell me until December 1st. I mean, consider how stressful it was for my wife and me 
that the season ends October 1st and I'm going through all of October and all of November, not knowing whether I'm coming back next year or not. And sure enough, you know, they would wait till December 1st to tell me. And that's what, what could I do about it? I couldn't, you know, I couldn't make any threats. But if you don't give me a better deal, I'm leaving because, you know, I'm not, yeah. I'm not that good a poker player. So, <laughs> so you're, you're tied, you're, you're, you're beginning with the, in the early or in the late seventies, uh, exciting time to be a part of pirates baseball as well with the, with the world series, specifically 79, but what was the atmosphere like for you? Well, the, the, the great thing is that despite the fact that there were a lot of Pittsburghers that were not ready to accept Milo and me, uh, I, I found that the organization um, was very hospitable. I found that the players with whom I worked those early years, Danny Murtaugh was in his final year in 1976. And then when Chuck Tanner came in, uh, Willie Stargell and Dave Parker and all those guys were very, very friendly to me and, and made me feel like I was a part of, of the organization. So that was a, that was a major, major plus for me. And, um, uh, um, but again, part of the process was, you know, consider that when I started in 1976 in those early years, you know, we only televised 25 games, mm -hmm. but when we televised, Milo would do six innings on TV and I'd do six innings alone on radio. And um, so part of the challenge, even though I had worked as a minor league announcer and worked alone as a minor league announcer, there, there are a number of things that, that, that came into my mind and, and concerns I had about how I'm going to deal with this, uh, doing six innings of radio and then three innings of television um, you know, without a partner, this is all on, on me. And so fortunately uh, I worked very hard. I, and this is another message that I get across to my students is that you cannot be a sportscaster and I don't care what it is. You cannot be a sportscaster doing anything. I don't care if it's high school sports or what it is. Even if you're announcing little league baseball, you cannot do a good job as an announcer if you don't put in, put in hours and hours of preparation. And um, I tell my students at Waynesburg that I strongly believe 85% of the success of a broadcast is determined by how well you prepare for the game. Because first of all, you need all of that information, including pronunciations of players. You need also to have a confidence that when you sit down in that chair, you're ready to go because you have worked hard to be a credible uh, announcer. Mm -hmm. So uh, the seven, the, the end of the seventies is great for, for the Pittsburgh Pirates. The eighties, not so much at the beginning of the eighties. Then you get towards the end of the eighties, Jim Leland comes in. What, I guess my first question on that is when did, when did you figure out that your, your phrase was, there was no doubt about it? When was that? Why was that? How did that connect? Well, first of all, let me, let, me, let me make a key point here. And that is that in my 33 years as a pirate broadcaster, nothing means more to me. There is nothing that means more to me about my 33 years than my friendship with Jim Leland. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, it is um, an anomaly that a major league broadcaster and a major league manager would have the friendship that we had and that Jimmy would afford me the opportunity to spend so much time with him to not only learn about the game, but Jim would share valuable bits of information with me. Um, what happened was that uh, about the second year that Jimmy was with the Pirates, he started inviting me up to his suite on when we were on the road. Mm -hmm. And so I was, after most road games, sitting in Jimmy Leland's suite with his coaches, listening to them talk about the game, listening to them talk about players. I remember one of the first times I was up in Jim Leland's suite, it was in New York. They were talking about players to trade and, and, and debating as to whether they should trade somebody. And I won't tell you who the player was at that point, but, but, you know, Jimmy was going around the room said, Hey, should we trade this guy? And, and, uh, and by the way, he got around to me and said, Jim, Lanny, what do you think? And I said, I don't think you should trade him. And he said, ah, what do you know? But, um, <laughs> but, um, 
but again, you have to and 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 understand too that not only was was Jimmy a great friend as it related to our careers as manager and broadcaster, but also a great friend. He did so much for me. He and Katie both did so much for me. And one of the great honors of my life is that when Jim and Katie had their their son Patrick, um, they asked me to be Patrick's godfather. And I I find I found that to be and still continue to cherish that is one of the great honors of my life. Now, do you, has there been any other managers in your time that, that you had as close of a relationship with or a similar relationship with, or is Jim Leland kind of the, obviously you're the godfather to his son. So. Um, it, well, because, because of my friendship with Jimmy, I got to know Gene Lamont really well. And so the same thing happened when Gene was the manager of the pirates. Um, we spent a lot of time together as well. Uh, but, but as I said earlier in this conversation, uh, there are, it is almost, um, it, it almost never happens mm -hmm. that a manager would open his door to a broadcaster the way that Jimmy uh, welcomed me into, uh, into his organization. And, and, you know, there were a number of times when, when, you know, for example, Jimmy might be talking about something with a coach uh, in the suite. And the next day I would go to him and say, Hey, you talked about this last night. Is there any way I can talk about it on the air? And, and sometimes he'd say, well, you can, you know, you can say this, but don't quote me. Um, a lot of times, I mean, I'll tell you one of my favorite Leland stories is that uh, one day Jimmy had a meeting and uh, when the meeting was over, I walked into his office and I said, Hey, uh, Jimmy, what was your team meeting about? And he looked at me and he said, Lanny, if I had wanted you to know, I would have invited you. <laughs> which seems like a typical, like a, like a perfect Jim Leland comment, which is, if I wanted to well, know, that, you'd that's, no, that's, that's Jimmy. I mean, Jimmy is, uh, it's one of the things I love best about him is that he's a real straightforward guy. And, um, you know, he used to, he used to give me a hard time because, uh, I guess I'm a little bit more of an individual that, um, uh, uh, isn't as opinionated as some. And, you know, there'd be times when you know, Jimmy would ask my opinion and I'd kind of waffle and he'd say, you know, and he'd make fun of me. He said, you know, why don't you come up with an opinion once in a while, you know, but um, that wasn't, you know, that wasn't the basis of our friendship. Our basis was that there was a loyalty to it. Um, and, um, uh, and I had no problem um, with, and I, matter of fact, on the air, I would very often make comment to fans, you know, uh, I remember being on a show one time where the host said to me, uh, uh, started questioning Jimmy, a move that Jimmy made. And I said to the host, I said, look, let me be honest with you and your listeners. I am such a believer in Jim Leland that if he made the decision, I am confident without a doubt that it is the right decision. And this guy kept coming back at me. And I said, wait a minute, you're not, a, you don't understand what I'm saying here. I I'm telling you, honestly, I am not objective when it comes to Jim Leland. So, you know, let's move on. That's, that's, that's what this is about. Yeah. So from a broadcaster point of view, with as close as you got to the team and whatnot, in the, or especially those early 90s, you know, the 90, 91, 92 teams, um, can you take us through the day in Atlanta? The, the throw, the Sid, Sid, I know, I, it's, I have to do it, though. It's a question I have to ask. Wait a minute, I got to, wait a minute, I got to, I got a, uh, a pair of scissors here, okay? Um, well, um, I, well, first of all, let me, let me say this to you. From a personal standpoint, remember in 1979, when we won the World Series, Milo and I were not allowed to do the World Series. Mm -hmm. Okay, we were not at that time. Major League rules were that local teams could not announce the World Series. Okay. So they changed the rule. So then the '90s, we would have had we won in '90, '91, '92, we would have done World Series games. And and you need to understand that being a young man that grew up watching New York Yankee baseball uh, and seeing the Yankees in the World Series almost every year, uh, one of my dreams was to announce a World Series game. You know, I was. I thought often about what, well, how will I open this broadcast? You know, hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 1992 World Series. Wow, I get goosebumps now just thinking about it. Okay, so, so it, from a personal standpoint, what transpired in 90, 91, 92 was, was painful for me, but more important to the issue is what it was for, for Jim. Uh, but, but let me first of all start with 90 and say that 
that the, the game that we won in, in, in St. Louis that clinched the division title in 1990, a 2-1 ball game, Doug Drebeck beat Joe McGrain, final out, Jose Lane, ground ball, et cetera. That, that, that is one of the highlights of my life, to be there and watch Jimmy and his players and Kent Biggerstaff, the trainer, and all of them who had worked so hard mm -hmm. to, to make this a championship organization again Boom. Okay. And then what was, was great about it was that, you know, we flew back on the team airplane. And by the way, that was the first time alcohol was allowed on the team airplane. Uh, and then we went, we went from the team airplane down to a restaurant in near three rivers stadium. So the celebration went on for a long time. And, and, and I was so thrilled to be a, a part of that though, you know, a very minimal part of that. Okay. So, uh, that, that was a big deal. All right, so now let's go ahead to 90. So we don't win in 90, we don't win in 91, we go to 92, and it looks like we're on our way to the World Series. And I can't deny to you, I'm thinking to myself, aha, I'm going to finally get a chance to do a World Series game. Well, okay, now the, the, the point that, that, I, that I always bring up, and I, and I do this because to me, there are so many misguided Pittsburgh people that, that have it wrong about that game, mm -hmm. okay? People that question whether, whether Jimmy should have started somebody and that Tim Wakefield should have started or come in in relief or et cetera, et cetera. You know, and again, all, in my opinion, not worthwhile debate. Yeah. And then this obsession with the Bonds throw, okay? And I, and I, I know there were two other plays in that inning that were much more devastating. The ground ball that went through Jose Lean's legs. That never and happened. And the fly ball into right center field that Cecil Espy should have caught. Okay. So why there's this obsession with bonds, all right, I just don't, I don't, um, I don't buy into that. And obviously pirate fans can do what they want to do in that regard. Or, you know, they have ownership to that. But let's let's be real about the fact. Jose Lean makes that play at second base. We go on to the World Series. No question about it. So you brought up Mr. Bonds, and he he has resurfaced again in, in media recently for um, not making it to the Hall of Fame. Um, now, you had a chance to watch him early in his career. You had the chance to watch him pretty much throughout his career. Uh, do you agree with that decision? Does he belong in the Hall of Fame? Well, um, he, he, the answer is yes. But here's the here's the a bunch of problems I have. Well, first of all, Pete Rose belongs in the Hall of Fame. Okay, Same nothing that job. Pete Rose did as a better impacted and did anything. He didn't get over four thousand hits because it had anything to do with his activities off the field. Okay, and to deny the all time hit leader being in the Hall of Fame. And look what's going to happen when we look back 10, 15 years from now. No Sammy Sosa. No Mark McGuire. No Roger Clemens. No Pete Rose. All right. Well. That's all wrong. Okay. Baseball never suspended these players. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, baseball and baseball fans basked in the glow of the Maguire Sosa chase. They basked in the glow and, and reaped financial rewards. People paid money to see those games. So, but here's my biggest problem is that the voting is wrong. When the Hall of Fame decided years ago, to have baseball writers vote for the Hall of Fame. It was baseball writers that traveled with the teams and saw 154 games every year. They were there road and home. Mm -hmm. Now you've got writers that are columnists that, that every now and then they flip on a TV game and maybe every now and then they go to the ballpark and plus they're being pompous. Do you mean to tell me you think that the average sports writer has a has a a, a, a moral compass? That the average sports writer is is the is the type of individual that you would want to have your children have them as as their heroes? The answer is no. Okay, that, that's not to say that you know that I, I I don't mean to 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 to, to belittle them, but I've been around enough sports writers to know. That, that their agendas are different than what people think it is. And so my argument is let's change the voting. Okay. One, third, one third baseball writers, one third current broadcasters, and one third 
former players who are in the Hall of Fame. Okay, and let's create a system where you have to induct at least five people every year. And so you have to make choices. Is it between this player or is it between this player? Or when I get to five, I'm done. I can't vote for any more. So I've, I've got to make those tough decisions. And, and uh, uh, again, I, I'm finding, you know, that, that, that there are so many sports writers that love when we get to this part because they love to write that article as to why they sent in an empty ballot or why they didn't vote for a player and they are acting holier than thou. So, and I guess we'll throw, there's one other name I was going to throw in there. Shoeless Joe Jackson should obviously be in the hall as well because. Who's that? Shoeless Joe should obviously be, he batted well, the highest in the series but, but, that he but, supposedly but, here, threw, but. Here, here's the thing, in the last 10 years, there have been some 76 NFL players inducted into Canton, Ohio. There's been about 36 Major League Baseball players. Okay, and I know that football rosters are bigger than baseball rosters. Okay, I understand that. But 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 if if you if I said to you that a Super Bowl coach won two Super Bowl championships, you would right away say to me he belongs in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Right. Yep. Danny Murtaugh. Danny Murtaugh won two World Championships. Why is he not in the Hall of Fame? There's not a re there shouldn't be a reason. So there's a whole again the the the, the yardstick is 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 crooked. It's it's not the, the um and and I understand people are going to be prejudiced based on I think Dave, I think Dave Parker belongs in the Hall of Fame. Um, but I admit that having known David and having watched him play with tremendous intensity. Mm -hmm. and seen him do what he did on the field uh not only as a player but always running out everything always hustling uh making great throws making great catches um I, you know I, again i i think that uh, the the voting procedure needs to be changed and and i mean we've had years where maybe one person got into the hall of fame in baseball but isn't there a minimum number in the NFL? I think so. I think it's, I think the minimum is three or four in the NFL. I'm not sure if it's, well, whatever. If, the number if there's is. a minimum, then, yeah. then you've got to really dig and say, okay, I've got to choose these people based on, on, on a certain standard. And, um, um, uh, but you know, this is all part of the talk show mentality now, you know, there's, you know, uh, you know, the guys that, that, that work at local Pittsburgh sports station, they're on the air 20 hours a week. Mm -hmm. Okay, they do four hours a day, five days a week. They're on the air twenty hours a week, so you, you know that they're always struggling for what are we going to talk about, and they're always and in even some cases they're they 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 they're the, the two guys that are on the air together will purposely debate an issue just to create some kind of you know conflict that is going to drive ratings. So um you know the, the, the remember all of this is against the backdrop of where we are now as it relates to sports reporting sports casting talk shows etc cetera, etc cetera. so there's one game there's one other game i want to ask you about it's uh i believe it was a doubleheader against houston brian giles hits a bases loaded grand slam um in that beautiful ballpark if, 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 at pnc uh, can you take us through that call? Well, a couple of things about that. Um, um, remember, it was the it was the it was the first game of a day night doubleheader. Mm -hmm. There had never been a day night doubleheader in Pirate history before, and the Pirates were down seven runs with two outs in the ninth inning. Think about that: down seven runs with two outs in the ninth inning, come back and win on the Giles Grand Slam. Um, and by the way, while we're talking about the Giles Grand Slam, let me also tell you that one of the things that, that is a mission of mine, uh, I've been on a mission now since I started teaching 13 years ago. Um, I, am, I am, and I am preaching this to my students, hoping that the next generation will buy into my philosophy. I am on a mission to eliminate the word unbelievable from the vernacular of sportscasters. Because it is my belief that nothing that a sportscaster says is unbelievable is truly unbelievable. 
remarkable, incredible, unusual, not likely to happen on a regular basis? Yes, but, but not, not unbelievable. unbelievable. And, and by the way, I submit to you, since I've been beating up on Tony Romo, that if you watch a Tony Romo football game and you have a you take a shot of alcohol, every time he says unbelievable, you will be drunk by the end of the first quarter. <laughs> so, um, uh, but anyways, I, and the reason I brought that up here is because I, there were a lot of people that said, wow, that was an unbelievable game. Well, no, it was, it was, uh, and, and I, and I thought through my time at, at um, PNC Park, I was there for eight years. I thought that was, and I, uh, and I might even argue that it's still the greatest game in the history of PNC Park mm -hmm. um, to this point. But again, I got to be careful because I don't have the, the catalog of information that I, that I, that I once did, but uh, quite a ball game. So after five, over th 5,000 games called, 33 years in the broadcast booth, what factored into the decision to walk away? Hmm. You want me to be honest with you? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, uh, um, I am, I am an alcoholic and, um, uh, fortunately I've been sober now, uh, for two years this time, but, um, I never, I never announced on the air. I never drank before again. And, and, but, but I did drink a lot. And uh, it affected not the job that I did on the air, because I'm proud of the job I did on the air, but it affected me at times with, as, to, as the kind of person I wanted to be. And consequently, when I got to the end of the 2008 season, um, I had a conversation with Frank Coonley, who at the time was the president of the Pirates, and, and he was of the opinion, and, and I wasn't surprised, he was of the opinion that it was time for me to step down. Um, what I don't like about that exchange was that I went off and we agreed on a press conference or not a press conference, but a press release that said I retired, which is what I did. But in essence, there was more to it than, than I admitted in the, in the story. And, um, and I have a lot of regrets about, about that. Um, um, first of all, I, I can't deny to you and your, your listeners and viewers that uh, one, of, one of the things that would have been a lot to me is if I had been the winner of a Ford Frick Award and been inducted into Baseball's Hall of Fame. Um, and let me say modestly, I, I, I think I was a pretty good baseball announcer. And uh, um, I, um, I would love to have that honor. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, but if I had stayed longer, if, if I had been there 40 years, for example, then I probably would be in, in Cooperstown right now. Um, uh, again, I, I'm pretty confident about my abilities as a baseball announcer and the commitment I made to being a baseball announcer. Um, but I also know that there's something about longevity and the game also, I know, um, I, I knew this before I left and then I had painful reminders of this after I left. The game has a tendency to forget about you when you leave. Uh, the game, the fans, sports writers, et cetera. So, um, you know, pretty much you have to deal with the fact that you're no longer there and move on and do something else, which is why Waynesburg means so much to me, because uh, I was afforded the opportunity to go on and do something worthwhile after I left the Pittsburgh Pirates. So um, not, a, not a great time in my life, but, um, but nevertheless, um, I, there's still an awful lot that I'm proud of. Well, and, and before we, we continue, I want, I, I mean, you were the, the I can, I could name 30 friends right off the top of my head right now that there's two voices of Pittsburgh Pirates baseball. It's you and Greg Brown. That's, <laughs> you either listen to it on the radio or you listen to it on TV, you watch it on TV. I mean, my, my dad and my grandfather were big on the, the baseball game was on. And as soon as they found that comfortable spot in the couch, they had, they, they would, you know, start making their symphony with their snoring. The only thing that I could drown out during baseball season with, with the snoring was you guys calling the games because it was the only person talking in the room. Um, well, so you and, definitely and, deserve to be in Cooperstown. That's, well, that's and let, let me, let me say off. Uh, well, thank you for saying that, but let me also say off what you just said that, you know, I'm, I'm blessed that in the 13 years that I've been gone, I still, I still have a large number of people that write me letters or stop me when they see me or, or reach out to me. You know, because I'm doing high school sports, I see a lot of people 
Um, and they they make a point of coming up to me and telling me how much they enjoyed. You know, I was just uh, before I did the interview with you, I was at a cigar bar. Um, I, I've changed one addiction to another. And um, um, and I was you know talking to a bunch of guys and three or four of them come up to me and said, hey, you know, you're the you know, you were the voice of our childhood and we share great memories together. And, and that means that means an awful lot to me. So when you when you make the decision to why Waynesburg, why was, was there any other op, were there any other opportunities to present themselves or was Waynesburg what, what made Waynesburg the place? Well, um, first of all, when I left the Pirates in 2008, um, I had a conversation with the superintendent of schools at Upper St. Clair High School, and they were looking for an athletic director. And um, I thought that'd be a great job for me. Thank goodness I did not take that job. Uh, but the, the superintendent, uh, they, th that was the winner between 08 and 09. And finally, the superintendent called me and said, we're going to post the job March 1st. Um, so I waited all winter to find out whether this would be, you know, my second career. And when I opened the newspaper, the, the paper to see the ad for Upper St. Clair right next to it was this ad for Waynesburg University right next to it. And it and I said, whoa, you know, um, but the problem with the with the ad was that it said you had to have teaching experience and you had to have a master's degree and I didn't have either. And so what I did that Sunday is I put my resume together and I created a cover letter. And I also went on the internet and I found out, uh, and by the way, the ad said, send your information to human resources. And I was concerned that if I send my information to human resources, that, that the HR guy would see that I don't have a master's degree, don't have teaching experience and just discount me. So what I did is I found out the name of the um, president of Waynesburg, Timothy Tyrene, and found out the name of the chairman of the comm department, Richard Krauss, and I sent three letters out the next day, three letters out, and um, with resume and cover letters. And I mailed it on Monday morning. And on Thursday afternoon, I got this phone call, and it was President Thyrene. And he said to me, are you serious? Are you serious? And I said, I am so serious. I'll be in your office at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. And I was, and within 10 days, they hired me. And um, Waynesburg is a wonderful place, but I learned during the interview process that it was a university that had committed itself to sports broadcasting. Uh, they, they had, and we still do have a TV truck. Mm -hmm. And so there is the opportunity for young men and women interested in sports casting and particularly play by play to do, we televise all the home football games. We televise all the home basketball games. And because the women and men in the president's athletic conference play double headers, then we're afforded the opportunity to do radio play by play, TV play by play. And so um, it has been, it has been wonderful. And, um, you know, admittedly, uh, though I was afraid when I started, you know, do, do I have the, I know my stuff. I know what I'm talking about. But I did not want to insult teachers by believing that I could just automatically be a good teacher. You know, I didn't know the word. I didn't know what the word pedagogy meant until I got to Waynesburg. OK, <laughs> um, I didn't know what that word meant. All right. I do now. All right. So I I went into it seeking a lot of advice from friends of mine and from other professors at Waynesburg and and. Uh, now, what's so gratifying is that um, I really do believe I'm making a difference and to have the opportunity to uh, mentor the next generation of, of sportscasters is, is a real honor for me. Well, I can tell you in my time at Bethany, we uh, there wasn't there's not many schools in the PAC that focus as much on their comm departments. I would say, you know, the, the 30 minutes between Waynesburg University and Bethany College those are your two big broadcasting. We're going to, we're going to put out as much as we can. You guys were always between 2010 and 2016. You were always someone that was, I, I don't want to say the rear view mirror because I think we were looking at your bumper, but we were definitely like, well, we need to get our broadcasts up to, if we're going to go and cover games, we need to cover games the way Waynesburg covered games. And, and I can tell you, maybe not from the professor standpoint, but as students that were broadcasters that were former athletes, 
we were looking at your broadcast as if we can if we can match their energy, we're we're already there. Let's and th so there was a little I don't know if it was a known competition, but we had a competition going with Waynesburg <laughs> over this way. Um, well, that, that's um, uh, Carla. That, that's great to to know, um, but you can understand because of just the nature of. Uh, of, of the business is that what, what I need to focus on and what I keep telling my students at Waynesburg and my colleagues at Waynesburg as well is we need, I mean, I know what it takes to be a good broadcaster. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand also that there are some schools, you know, that's one of the problems with, with high school programs that have television stations is that the, the, the individual that is running the TV operation is a technical guy and does not have the information to know what it is to prepare. You know, when, when I've done high school sporting events and I go into a high school and I see students announcing the games, I'm, I am disappointed that they're, they're basically showing up with rosters and that's it. And, and so, um, you know, I tell my students 85% of the success of a broadcast is determined before you go on the air. And, and when I do high school basketball, for example, um, I put in nine hours of preparation mm -hmm. to do a high school game. Um, and, and you cannot, you cannot do a good job um, if you don't understand, number one, that you need to prepare and that number two, know how to prepare. And, um, and so I, you know, I've made sure that the commitment that I had to preparation as a broadcaster has carried over to not only my commitment doing other sports. I do the Pony League World Series every year. I've done West Virginia basketball. I've done West Virginia baseball. Everything I do, I know that there are hours of preparation. And even to the point that I will not accept a job, and I don't care whether it's high school, college, whatever, I won't accept a job as an announcer. I don't think I can put the preparation in that I need to. Well, and so my last question teaching wise is specifically for the field. So I've, I've had a couple other people on and they've talked about how the in the classroom is, is valuable, but in the profession, it's more about getting out and getting the experience. Now, are you of the same belief that the classroom and the book stuff is great, but that does not prepare you to be in the booth or behind camera or directing or producing or whatever your field might end up being? Well, a couple of points off that. First of all, yeah, basically, when we're talking about classroom textbooks, you know, the lecture process is about theory, all right? Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, is that in my particular case, okay, I can, uh, I can, and I do this. So I teach my students how to announce a basketball game and teach them all of the rules and techniques that they need to have to do an effective job as a basketball play-by-play -play announcer. But then I'm bringing them back into the classroom after they've done it and discussing with them what they thought they did right and what they thought they did wrong. And here, here's the thing. I had a friend of mine a couple of years ago that I was struggling with my golf game. And he said, why don't you videotape your swing? And I said, why? I wouldn't know what I'm looking at. Well, the point here is, is that is that a young person going back listening to his own tape won't know what he's really listening for. So that's an advantage that I bring to the equation is that I can listen to a broadcaster and I can tell them for the most part, good job, but here are some things that you, you missed and here are some points that you probably didn't think about or you thought you were doing, but you weren't doing. And by the way, I teach rules at Waynesburg. Uh, not that I want them to be like me, but I want them to appreciate the fact that if they learn rules, mm -hmm. then they will not forget to do what they have to do. For example, if you think about it, when somebody is called for a foul in basketball, a shooting foul, there is a natural progression that needs to be followed. Okay. Number one, on whom is the foul? Mm -hmm. Okay. Number two, how many fouls does that player have? Number three, how many team fouls in the half? Number four, who's at the line? And then number five, the result. And then sandwiched in between four and five, or before four and after five, is nuggets about free throw percentage, 
uh, where the player is from, et cetera, et cetera. I teach rules also as it relates to one of the biggest criticisms of sportscasters is they don't give the score enough. Okay? So what I teach my students in basketball is give the score every whistle. Give the score every time it changes score. Give the time, score every time it, it, there's an end of a period. Mm -hmm. Give the score every time you go to a commercial break. Think about it. If you give the score every whistle in basketball, there is no way. No. And, and by the way, you could put that rule into hockey as well. You give the score every time there's a whistle in hockey, there's no way anybody can say you don't give the score. No. And I, when I say score, I mean score time and period. Yeah. Because it doesn't help me as a listener if you tell me what the score is and you don't tell me where we are in the game. And that's that's really the point of the of the broadcaster, correct? Is you're especially on the radio side, you're the eyes, you're the eyes for the audience. They're, they need to know what who has possession, where 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 we're going, where we are in the game, what's the score, how much time's left, et cetera. That's part of the whole kind well, of and well, and, and I, and again, I, I, I teach, uh, I, I create for my students a priority list. Okay. Okay. And the number one thing on the priority list is the call to the play. You know, you know, what's happening, who's got the ball, what team, what are they doing with it, et cetera. But keep in mind that when you make a commitment to call a play, you cannot do a good job if you don't go into the game confident of two things number one that you know how you're going to refer to different spots on the floor number one and number two that you have memorized the names and numbers of the players okay when i do a high school basketball game on friday night i spend all day friday with a piece of paper writing down names and numbers and and by the way i tell my students you, you, if if the coaches gives you a list of 15 players OK, and if you have 15 players on each team, you don't need to memorize 15 players. No. You need to memorize maybe eight on each team. Because those, but especially the starting, you need to know that when you go off and start the game, you've got those 10 players down cold. Mm -hmm. So that the minute the ball goes to that player, you can identify. Them. You can't be in a position where you see the player and his number and you look down at a roster. It doesn't work that way. Plus the fact that to do a good job with radio play-by-play, -play, you need to keep score. Yeah. So you need to create a score sheet for yourself. And that's also something that, you know, I tell my students they have to be meticulous about. You have to create the score sheet and the information has to be on the score sheet. What grade is the student? How tall is he? And then maybe if you're doing a college game, where do they go to high school? What is their major in college? There's all this bits of information. You need roster. You need standings. You need um, you need information about the other teams in the conference who they're who they're playing today. What's the playoff picture look like? You need all of this information because you don't know what you're going to need to use to fill. Should you do you know when there's a timeout, right? That means you know Pavlov's dog timeout. I got to fill. What am I going to talk about the coach? Am I going to talk about standings? What am I going to do? So, um, again, I, I'm confident that I know what the students need to know. Now, the thing is to drive home. I had a session yesterday with my students where, where I was really upset because, because a number of them had, and by the way, they're doing an audition tape. It was, a, it was not on the ear. But I had told them, I only want you to worry about two things calling the play and identifying players and keeping score and telling your audience what the score time and period was. Now, the only two things I want you to worry about mm -hmm. in this audition tape, that's all I want you to worry about. Yeah. Okay? Well, some of my students admitted to me that they had memorized the Waynesburg players, but they hadn't done a good job memorizing the Chatham players. And I, and I got really upset with them because, uh, you know, I made it perfectly clear to them that the assignment was not that difficult, providing that they made some bit of commitment to this memorization process. And, um, um, you know, I'm <laughs> admittedly, I'm like a coach at times. I'm not afraid to get mad at my students because, because I care. Well, so, and, and with the caring, you bring up a very good point. There's, there's, there was a, in my notes here, there was something specifically I wanted to get you uh, or get more information on. Uh, the Family Links Golf Classic, which has raised over $1.6 million for mentally challenged people and their families. Why mentally challenged people and their families? Why, how did that all come about? And, and what does that mean to you? 
Well, uh, first of all, again, going back to the Bob Prince thing, Bob Prince saying to me, hey, Lanny, you need to be more than just uh, a broadcaster. Um, and, and, and I knew from, from being in Pittsburgh that Bob had made a commitment to, to helping charities. And so I wanted to do the same thing. Initially, my wife became a board member of what was the South Hills Child Guidance Center. And then at some point I became a board member and was, was convinced by a dear friend of mine at one point that I should host a golf tournament. Um, I had put him off a couple of years because I, I told him, and I felt this way, I didn't want to be just a, a name on a golf tournament. I wanted to make sure that I was making a legitimate commitment to this charity. Um, and so as it turns out, I, uh, um, you know, found myself supporting a charity that dealt, dealt with mental health and an issue that has affected me uh, because I've had mental health issues as well. And it's also affected my family. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it turned out to be that, uh, you know, we weren't just promoting the charity, but we, we, we had experience as it related to what became, what became family links. But, um, you know, uh, the, the, the success of the tournament is based on um, the, the support of my family, uh, support of my friends, uh, major advertisers. Giant Eagle has been a tremendous supporter of my golf tournament. Uh, I will not shop at any other grocery store. I am loyal to them. Um, and, and because you can't, you can't keep a tournament going for over 30 years if, if you don't have people supporting you and advertisers supporting you. And I've been very fortunate in that regard. So the la last two questions, and you've given a lot of advice to people that are that may be looking to get into the industry. What if you could if you could pull give us Professor for Terry's nuggets. If you're trying to get into broadcasting or trying maybe maybe broadcasting is not for you. What are the best ways to figure that out? Well, um, th th that's a tough question because there there may be you know there may be young people out there that that know this is what they want to do mm -hmm. okay and they're like me at age 13 14 they know this is what they want to do and i've met some of those people yeah i've met some of those young people um and then there are them those individuals that think they want to do it um my grandson is currently a student at waynesburg university and by the way he's a great basketball announcer because he loves basketball mm -hmm. But I would admit to you that at times I've spoken to my grandson about the fact that I'm not sure, you know, he has bought in um, maybe three quarters of the way. Okay. He's not bought in a hundred percent of the way yet. And, and, and I, so I don't want to discourage somebody that is still investigating. And that's one of the reasons why at Waynesburg, we are so strong about the fact that when you come to Waynesburg, we're going to put you on the air right away mm -hmm. because I don't want a student to go through a year or two without doing sports casting and without doing play by play for fear that they'll find out either a, that they don't like it or that they'll find out. And I think this is more relevant is that they really do like it, that it really is a fun experience and it's a, it's a rewarding experience. And so we need to, you know, as I say, we put our freshmen right on the air. Are, at times, do they sound terrible or not up to par? Yes. But how are they going to learn? How are they going to grow? How are they going to develop and hone their skills if not afforded the opportunity to, to do that? And, um, um, you know, and I care a great deal about my students. And, and so it's important, you know, I tell my students all the time that, you know, I may only be at Waynesburg two days a week, but I'm a seven day a week professor. If you have any questions at all, concerns, questions about the business or something that's come up in, in, in broadcast related or school related, then, then let me know. Well, and I, I think it's interesting as, as we wrap this up, I think it's interesting you point out that as freshmen, you get people on the air, being that at the beginning, we talked about how you looked at Syracuse and Ithaca and the big thing about the bigger schools that are known for communications and specifically broadcasting 
is at Syracuse, you're lucky if you touch a camera before you're a junior. And, and that's that thing at the bigger schools, whereas it seems at Waynesburg specifically, let's get you involved. Let's get you in hands on, learn, learn the craft. Um, so I, I wanted to say thank you very much. We've come to that point. Uh, thank you very much for, for taking time out of your day to be a part of the show. Um, thank you for being the guy for at least 25 years of my life for, for Pirates Baseball. And uh, for those of you at home or, or listening, you can find us on uh, Instagram. It's dingo underscore talk. Twitter, it's at dingo talk. TikTok, it's at dingo talk. And you can type dingo talk into YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Well, again, I want to thank you for allowing me to, 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 to do this with you today, to invite me on, and also to, to tell folks that, that if, if any of you feel a connection to what I was doing as a pirate broadcaster, you can track me down at Waynesburg. Uh, I am um, 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 one individual that will answer every one of his pieces of mail, um, not by email, by the way, but by, by regular mail. I'm a big letter writer. I love writing letters. And so I'm most, of fort I'm, I'm, I'm most fortunate that, yeah, as I said at the outset of this interview, I'm a, I'm a blessed individual and, and, uh, um, and I thank everybody that's ever connected with me as a pirate broadcaster and as a, just as a person as well. Well, again, thank you for, for taking time. I know it's, it's uh, middle of the week, so it's a little crazy, but um, Lady for Terry, former voice of the Pittsburgh Pirates and now current professor at Waynesburg University for Communications. I am Carlo Guadagnino. This has been Dingo Talk, and you can catch us next Thursday at 10 a.m. Chuckleheads. <laughs>